Hello and welcome back to another Scale War Machines video and the second part in this series. For those who missed part one, the goal here is to time how quickly I can paint and weather one thirty-fifth scale Tamiya King Tiger model, built by my friend Herbie. The last film saw me get the model primed, ready for colour with a bit of help from Herbie. That took us about one hour and we got it to this stage. In this video, you'll see how the project developed and how long each subsequent stage took. With the model prepped, we entered the second hour of painting by covering over the pre-shaded and primed model with a base coat. Now, people often comment what's the point in pre-shading the model if it will all get covered in multiple layers later. It's a valid question and pre-shading can remain evident in monotone paint schemes and even tritonal camo schemes, at least for a part of the process. It's really down to how far you push everything. At the end of this video, we'll see if any of the previous pre-shading does indeed remain and whether it was all worth it. See if you like that airbrush. Yeah. It'll go a bit lighter. Yeah, it doesn't matter on the top, but yeah, you want to keep the... Maybe practice so you get you. I think you're pulling back way too far, so start at the front and just gently. You don't really want to pull it back too far. Mm. So what you can do on this, I'll just show you. So what you're tending to do is you're you're coming in kind of like that. Yeah. Straight and away. so what you do is you start at the front and then you get further away to give a more general coat, but you. We're still only just at the beginning. What you can do is you can set that. That locks it. It's called a paint control valve. That means it won't go further back. So try that. Hit that first. And then just go a bit further away. Yeah, that's where you want to be, right there. Mm. Just very, very light. It's all light coats. <laughs> what we'll do, I think we'll do the main coat and then we can mask that off and do kind of a different finish on the layer of things. Yeah, the uh, more I think that more like the idea of the old um, guards off or broken off. Yeah, okay, so we'll mask yeah, that. Do that. As Herbie had an idea of the colour scheme he wanted, we used some photos as inspiration and started off with Dunkelgelb as the base for a typical German three-tone camo scheme. The reference was from AK Interactive Real Colours range and you can see the shade here, reference RC059 Dunkelgelb Nach Muster, or dark yellow. It was diluted with their own brand thinners at a ratio of 70-30 paint thinners. The colour depicts the famous German Dunkelgelb or dark yellow shade and the paint was applied in thin diffuse coats by airbrush. The intention was very much to allow the pre-shading to show through. Nice. Okay, let's just do these now. Followers of the channel will know that I will happily use any paint brand and nowadays they're all pretty good. These are great paints too. They spray well and though a bit high odour, they give a great finish. Try and make some look a bit different. Yeah. Different colours. We'll do that in a sec. If you want to see the review of these paints, then check out the video we made a while back. To spray, we're using the Harder and Steenbeck Evolution Silver Line, but you'll see us use different airbrushes later on, as the idea was to get Herbie to try different styles of airbrush. The 
The next stage was to apply the green shade freehand with the lower portion of the hull masked off. I began to spray the green colour in patches using reference RC047 Olive Groom. It's a largely made up scheme, but as crews could apply their own camouflage, there is scope for variety and creative expression here. You'll notice that we attempt to keep large areas of the Dunkel Gelb free of the green, so the pre-shading is still evident. This was a chance to get Herbie to have a go at freehand camo with a double action airbrush. It's a good idea to start on a scrap piece of paper or as here the masking tape to get settled into the spraying. The edges are less clean now because it's push on because most of that will be lost. I think now maybe that's probably about enough green don't yeah, you think? Yeah. We did eventually decide to apply some ammo acrylic reference MIG 003 to add interesting highlight areas within the green tones. At this stage the pre-shading is arguably still working but the next step will get interesting. As I mentioned in part one, this was really a timed challenge, and that resulted in some dubious choices made under pressure. The third colour in the camo scheme is a case in point. It's the AK Interactive Rot Brown, or Red Brown, tone. But as you'll see, it came out a bit too vibrant and overpowering. Anyway, we persisted for now, safe in the knowledge that it can be addressed later. After about an hour and a half, the tank was blocked out in the tritonal camo scheme. To tone things down, I opted to go over the red shade with a more muted red-brown colour from Life Colour. This also had the neat effect of creating fading over the darker base red-brown shade. The colour looks patchy and inconsistent, which will help with weathering. The final step is a tip that applies to all multicolour paint schemes. If you mist over a very thin coat of the base coat, it will blend all the colours, tone everything down and unify the entire paint job. Here you can see the effect. To seal everything in, a liberal coat of Johnson's Clear floor polish was applied as a varnish by the airbrush. Just coat everything for a tough, protective layer. By this stage, the pre-shading is visible under the Dunkel Gelb, somewhat visible under the Olive Grun, and barely visible at all under the Rock Brown. To make it consistent, you probably need to post-shade that colour to make the effect really stand out which does defeat the purpose of our first steps. But two out of three isn't bad for now. Next, it's time to apply the markings or decals. The kit decals could have been used, but we decided to make a fictional tank, as opposed to a real vehicle, as offered in the kit. The Zimrit Herbie applied is important here, as it will affect the way the markings go on. I used a set of Wilder dry transfers specifically for Zimrit to apply the German crosses. The numbers, meanwhile, were from another wilder set. To help apply them, I used Archer Transfer's wet medium paper. I've done videos on these great products before, but in simple terms, you rub the marking onto the paper, then you apply it like a water slide decal. In this process, I used Decal Set and Decal Sol, the two-stage solution from Microscale. After careful application, they were gently and carefully bedded down using pressure from a cotton bud or Q-tip and a rubber artist's blending tool.
We're approximately two hours in and this is the result. The barrel received a coat of German grey from AK Interactive. This matched the photo we used as inspiration and would also make the model look more interesting visually. So with the clock ticking, I faced another challenge. Our paint scheme called for the numbers to be picked out in black inside the white lines. My first instinct was to use a marker pen, but that proved to be a mistake. A bit like with the red shade earlier, when you model a lot, you get fairly confident you can salvage most things that go wrong. In this case, experience told me to stop and try a different approach. After a bit of touching up, I reverted to using black enamel paint. The advantage being that mistakes could be easily cleaned up with thinners, which wasn't the case with the marker pen. After a lot of fiddly corrections and trial and error, I managed to get used to using the enamels and cleaning up as I went. Any final corrections could be made using white for the edging until I got a result I was happy with. The next stage was to show chips and damage to the Zimrit, which had revealed the primer underneath. To that end I picked out details and areas of damage with a life colour reference, rust base colour and a fine brush. It seemed to work well with the aftermarket Zimrit product used and deliberately damaged by Herbie. To take the paint job into three hours, the tracks and onboard accessories or tools were first painted in track primer by Ammo. This was followed with the Ammo Rust Primer reference. They were then rusted with liberal applications of an ammo wash product, Light Rust Wash, reference 1004, was applied and allowed to dry, giving an authentic weathered and rusty finish. The hairdryer helped speed up the drying process. Here's how the model looks after three hours. I'll let you decide if the pre-shading was worth it. Leave a comment below if you think it was and what you think about the effect. Maybe when we begin the weathering process in detail, it will be virtually invisible. Tune in next time to find out as we finish off the weathering and I race to get the model done as quickly as possible. Watch as the minutes tick away and we tackle the next weathering effects. It will be a stressful race to the finish line as more washes and effects are added from chipping to shadows to oil and dust effects. See you then, and please don't forget to like, comment, and why not subscribe to see how long the next stages take me. Bye for now. Subscribe for our latest videos.